Welcome into Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited about our guest today. Way back, and when I say way back, way back a while back. It's been a minute or so, as the kids say today. We interviewed a very talented woman by the name of Amber. Amber is the president of Southern Oregon Runners. You might be asking yourself, why am I talking about that? Why am I bringing that up? Well, here's a couple of reasons. One, go back and listen to that episode. It's pretty awesome. But what I didn't know at the time was Amber has a sister. Now, which sister is more talented? You know, I don't know. We're going to have this sister rivalry perhaps today. Let me introduce you to Amber's sister. She, of course, is a mother of two amazing kids. She wants us to know that first and foremost. She is a business owner of Wellness Studios, specializing in nutrition and corrective massage. She's also a physical therapist assistant and an elite personal trainer. So if you're in that fitness space, if you're in that nutrition space, which, hello, who isn't in that space? currently trying to get better nutrition, trying to get better fitness, this may be the lady for you to come and talk to. Now, I got to warn you about this though. We're going to be talking about fitness. We're going to be talking about nutrition, but it's all kind of really in the background because something somewhat tragic has happened to our guest today. And she's going to tell us more about that momentarily, but help me welcome her in. Her name is Nicole Biscoborn. Welcome in, Nicole. How are you? I'm good. How are you? You know, I always say better than I, I deserve, but is that like kind of cliche and nerdy to say? I don't know. It is cliche and nerdy. You deserve what you deserve, right? You deserve what you deserve. I don't. I don't even know how to respond to that. There we are. I know. All right. All right. So I deserve what I deserve. Okay. So Nicole, I'm excited that you're here today. Thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Getting into you and kind of what you're all about. I love I love the fact that we got to connect and I know you are a fitness fanatic. Is that accurate to say in some respects? Oh, absolutely. So you could help me and others also get in shape from our Thanksgiving holidays that is going to be here before we know it, right? Help us get that weight loss before Christmas comes. So we look better in the Christmas photo than we did in the Thanksgiving family photo, right? No, you look happier. So it's not about looking less or anything like that. It's about looking happier and giving yourself that motivation and that goal that you could do it. That's what fitness is all about. Not, it's not less, it's more. <laughs> it's not less, it's more. Well, there right. we go. All right, we'll have to dig more into that. But before we go f- too far down the road with you and your story and what you're about, I got to ask this question. So it's very important. Now, I don't know if you've ever been interviewed by any places or anything like that, or after this, you might become famous. Who knows? I guarantee this. Nobody's probably going to ask you this question as they start off a, a chat or a time together with them. And that's this question. You're making me nervous. <laughs> Yeah, it, you should be nervous. This is the part we really want to get okay. nervous about is this question. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Take some breaths. Here we go. You ready? All right. What style of shoes does Nicole like to wear? Uh, like running shoes or workout shoes or what? I'm going to let you interpret that however you desire. Like what is this style or brand or shoe that Nicole likes to wear? You know, my favorite are Sanooks and like they are the like super hippie shoes. I don't know if you've ever seen them. So my favorite pair are ones that are made of recycled yoga pants. And yeah, they're the best shoe in the whole world. I have heard of Sanooks. So the reason why we asked this question, right, is because we're in your shoes today. Oh, okay. So we're in your Sanooks, if that's the shoe of choice. That is my shoe of choice, yes. My recycled yoga pants shoes. Yeah, we stopped asking ladies, especially like what size of shoe they wore, because some ladies got a little self-conscious about that. Like they were like, well, you know, I don't even know what a good like big lady size shoe is. Like is a 12? Is that, I don't know. Is Do they make a 13? I, I don't they even do. know. They, they make okay. all sizes, yeah. <laughs> wow. So we stopped asking that question because ladies were getting really agitated by that question. And I was like, well, I don't want to start off the talk with an agitated woman. Nobody wants that in their life anyway, right? So we stopped asking that so we just strictly went to what style and brand so you answered that very well all right so getting into your story now i gotta ask this question and i'm gonna try to be delicate but i but i think it it really requires an answer of all of us on some level right and it's this question of are you enough have you ever in your mind or, or in your background or in all that you've been a part of, have you ever struggled on some level with not being enough? And if so, what was that like? 
Oh my gosh. So yeah, the shoes was not the hardest question you were going to ask me. (laughs) Absolutely. So a little bit about my backstory. I was a very young mom, had two kids by the time I was 22. I was married to a military man at the time. And just in that moment, kind of playing mom and dad, having young children, you ask yourself, like, am I enough to be doing this? Like, this is a lot. It's overwhelming. I think anytime you get in a new situation, you don't feel like you have the the resources or the knowledge or the know-how, like you just sit there and you're like, I am faking it and I am hoping that I'm making it. So absolutely, like that has led into so many rabbit holes for me. I don't know who in the world hasn't thought that question. Well, you know, we asked this question way back when we started our our season, our season nine that we're in right now. You know, I always kind of try to like survey says, you know, the family feud mentality in some respects. Like when I have this idea for the show, I take it to some people that I know and I kind of survey them and I throw it out on the social medias and I kind of just try to get a barometer, a gauge of a topic that we're going to maybe look into. You know, sometimes these topics come to me in like the middle of the night, like three in the morning, or maybe I'm out on a run or which I don't do enough of. So don't tell your sister that I'm not running as much as I should be, but maybe I am out on a run. Maybe it's only a mile because I'm so like out of shape and need help. (laughs) I know a girl. (laughs) You know a girl. Okay, good. I do too. In that, like, I do remember the moment when I really started thinking about, you know, have people struggled with, are they enough? And again, I threw it out to a couple of friends that I know, a couple of people that I really trust in and actively listen to the show. And I just said, hey, you know, I know this is going to sound crazy, but do you think anybody's ever struggled with, are they enough? And the feedback just started pouring in from people. And to your point, somebody actually did say anyone who says that they haven't, they went, they went really deep. They said anyone who hasn't really is a liar. For sure. I was like, what? A liar? When I think of a liar, I think of a liar, someone with the intent to deceive someone else. That's what I think of a liar as. In that same kind of thread, have you ever in any way lied to yourself that in some level, like, no, I, I, I'm okay, I'm, I'm all right, and maybe lied to others that like deep down you knew you weren't really enough, but you again, to your point, you were trying to kind of fake it till you made it? Maybe speak to that if you wouldn't mind. Oh, absolutely. One thing that comes to mind is, golly, so just being that young mom, my ex-husband had deployed. It was the first time being alone. Everybody had moved. I was literally 2,000 miles away from my whole family. I had a two and a three-year-old. I started struggling with an eating disorder because it was my means of control. And it was, I need to be better. Like that, that mom fear that, um, and that's weird to say like, okay, I got an eating disorder because of mom, but the pressure to get your body back, the pressure to be like on top of everything to be enough, right? Like my, I, I'm enough, like as a woman, after I had these kids, like, and I proved it by how great of shape I was in or how much weight I lost or, you know, how I can take care of these kids without any help or, you know, so when you ask that question, it's, it's absolutely true. Like you're trying to prove almost to yourself and to everybody, like I've got this when really you're just in denial like instead of saying hey like this is hard this is super hard and I absolutely agree with your friend who said that anybody who says that they're feeling like they're more than enough is a liar and I'm not saying that in a mean way I think that we deceive ourselves into thinking that we don't need other people and that just shins us down this rabbit hole of sadness and hardship instead of asking for help and being real and allowing that space for other people to say wow it is hard it's hard to raise kids. It's hard to get in shape. It's hard to eat properly. It's hard to manage stress or say like this life isn't something that I was wanting to do. You know. First off, thanks for being honest enough to, to kind of walk us down that road, right? Of, of talking about an eating disorder and talking about how maybe you had some mom insecurities and, and had some denial in your life, right? I mean, that's, that's some tough stuff, right? It's definitely tough, but you know, my, my hope is, and when you ask me to come on this show, my hope is that whatever piece that comes to mind that I share becomes somebody else's light. And I've always like told myself, even in the thick of like my eating disorder, the thick of feeling like super lonely or not feeling enough as a mom, as a wife, as a woman, as any of that, I always said like, when I get out of this, I will turn around and I will help another person. And that's what I've tried to do with like the business that I've created and the field that I've gotten into is to turn around and, you know, use my knowledge and experience to kind of steer someone elsewhere. Yeah, no, I I think that's the power of where we are in in life in general right now. If we're going to make 
you know, big picture world that we're in is I think on some level, I always hate to use the word we, so I'll make it about me in this moment. I know for me, I really have tried to use this show as a platform, as a way to amplify a voice. You know, maybe it's a voice that needs a microphone in front of them to help elevate or amplify again that message that they need to get out. And if I can help in any way in that, absolutely. I want to be a, a source in a, in a platform that can be done, that can be done in, you know? And so for me, again, I just think what an amazing opportunity for you, right? To take what you've learned, take that experience, take that heartache, take that pain and to say, no, this is not going to define me. This isn't going to be the definition of, of Nicole means this. No, Nicole's going to mean this now, right? And kind of rewriting that story. Would you say that's true of you? Absolutely. I would 100% say that's true. I got divorced early this year as well. So, I mean, that was a huge shakeup and a huge, are you enough? Like, are you enough to start over? Are you enough to do, you know, so that plays right into that question that you asked me. Going through like, you know, eating disorder and all the all those things that I have overcome, I'm like, you know what? We're going to have fun with this. We're going to have fun with a new start. We're going to turn around and we're going to show other people. You can start over. You can start again. You can fail and you can try again. You can try again. You can try again. And that's what life's about. Life is about leading with love, love for yourself and love for others. That, that's my hope from all of this. Let's walk back down that road of, of the eating disorder. How did you get out of it? When did you kind of recognize that you had a problem? Were others around to kind of point that out? Or did you recognize that kind of in yourself that you really had, to, had an issue and that you needed to get? help from it oh man that is such a such a road it was one of those denial things for a really long time i was essentially on my own for a good amount of time like i said my ex had deployed everybody was away from me it was just me i had slipped down a really 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 unhealthy road to the point where my husband had or my ex-husband had come back and he was like whoa you're not well and it was overwhelming to him like just the the physical change was overwhelming for him to see and I think that, you know, he did his best at the moment to kind of help and eventually reached out to my family and my family from where they were 2000 miles away could do what they could. So it was a long, it was a long road. And essentially the thing that got me out was after I had gotten very, very sick. Like I was literally double digit weight. I had passed out. My, my ex-husband was like trying to get me to be coherent at the time. It just wasn't a thing. And I was able to you know, come out of that horrible blackout and be like, oh my God, you're going to die. It was this moment with myself being horribly sick, horribly thin, having two young children. And I'm like, I don't, I can't do that. I can't leave that. I can't, you know? And, and it's funny that you asked the question, like, are you enough? Because I remember being in that moment, being really sick and thinking like, these girls would be better without me. It would be better without the example that I'm showing them right now. And yeah, they were like very young, like a two and three at the time, you know, but I just remember like having that voice in my head, like you're not good enough for them. And it was that fight. Like, no, I am like, they need me. They need me. Like, so essentially just that really low rock bottom point where I just was kind of dying essentially when I passed out because my body just gave out. So coming to that moment, coming out of it, I'm like, I got to do what I got to do, you know, and that included like therapy. It included accountability of the kind of foods that I'm putting in my body every, you know, hour on the hour and just fighting, mentally fighting every single day until I got to a place where my body was nourished enough and my brain was nourished enough to be like, wow, you're, you're sick. And, and help myself. Wow. You mentioned hearing, maybe it wasn't an audible voice. Maybe it was a feeling or very audible, <laughs> very audible voice. Okay. Fair enough. I didn't want to put words in your mouth by any means in that moment of, of having that audible voice say, you're not enough. These girls would be better without you. Whose voice was that? Was that your voice or maybe, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to let you interpret that. Whose voice was it that was saying those things to you? Do you feel like, you know, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. And at the time I was really just down. So I don't, I don't know. Like I would like to think it was just some evil, you know, voice just like going after it. Like, a, you know, I always thought of it as like, okay, the, the devil's coming after me. Like, I don't, I don't know how true that is or whatever. This it was no good voice. It was no healthy voice. And I'm sure it was my deep down with my own insecurities. It was absolutely my own, fear and sadness just projecting 
and driving the boat because what you truly believe you move towards. So deep down, like in that, in the, my bones of bones, I believe that I wasn't enough. I believe that my kids would be better without me. You mentioned getting help. You mentioned getting counseling. How long of a road of, if you will, recovery did it take to kind of get you, I don't know if the word is back to where you are now, or, or maybe that's still in some levels you got to be mindful of. Help me with that if, if, if you can. It was quite a long road just because I think, you know, we did end up moving with the military. So it wasn't, there was no consistency there. It was a lot of me pushing and pushing the counselor that I had wasn't super great. It wasn't her specialty. So by no means, like, was it like, oh, I, I met some great lady. We did a six week program and we were better. I think that once you have dealt with something like this, it is something that you will always have in the back of your mind. It is like the demon that you wake up to fight against. And some days it's definitely smaller and little. And you're like, oh, like sit down, like, you know, like sit down we're going to, we're fine today. And some days it's like, okay, we're going to go to, we're going to go to war. We're going to fight. And it's never gone, but it's definitely less. It is a process. I think for me to physically get better was pretty immediate because when your body is pretty sickly, like it will heal itself physically. It's the mind that takes a long time. Why do you think it takes so long to get recovery from it? A lot of that, I think, is just the thought pattern that you have day in and day out. You start trudging these same thoughts because you have to have these almost this record, this nasty record playing in your head, just driving you to essentially slowly commit suicide with an eating disorder. That's what you're doing. You're slowly committing suicide to your body. And so you have to have these negative thoughts playing constantly in order for you to do that to yourself. It's, it's pretty horrific if you really think about it. With the mind, you have to stop and think about what you're thinking about. You have to really fight the feelings and things that feel real that aren't real. So you have to change that thought pattern. And that is hard to do. What's the danger, do you feel like, if you didn't change that thought pattern, if you didn't get the help you needed? Where do you think that wrote? Now, I know it's... Obviously, it's a hypothetical. It's a what if. So we don't really know. You know you. So what do you think would have happened to you had you not gotten the help you needed? I should have been in the hospital, honestly, that night. Like, I don't even know how I came through that conversation for my ex-husband who was on the front lines of that one. <laughs> how I managed to pull through that night. Where I would have been was probably in the hospital or dead. Let's be real. Like, I'm an all-in girl. So <laughs> this is not one situation I should have went all in on. <laughs> Yeah, because again, I I think there's such a danger if we don't get help when we really need it and we really don't see it. And we think, oh, it's it's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's it's I'm okay. I'm all right. You know, it's it, it's okay. You'll be okay. But is that is that more denial? Is that more lying to yourself? I don't know. Absolutely lying to yourself because it took a long time for me to own and actually say I have an eating disorder. It would just be like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm just being really healthy or I don't like that food or, you know, whatever lie that you tell yourself, you know, whatever information that you had read on the internet that supports your unhealthy habit, that's exactly what you would run with. So you just, you stay in that denial. You stay in how unhealthy you are because you're not willing to face the, the ugly monster. So you get out of it you are kind of on this new track of life because you see the value in, you know, obviously not being, not leaving your girls alone. That's important to you. In any way, did the eating disorder lead to the the marriage dissolving in any way? Or, I mean, were there other reasons or do you feel like that played a part in it? I think it played a factor, honestly. Like I have to own my own peace in the marriage and that is a lot. It, it limits what what life looks like and I was I was a lot you know I was a lot it was like we can't eat at this restaurant we can't you know I don't want to eat out or I don't want to do this it's not you're not very spontaneous you're not very fun you're very rigid you know you're very like self-absorbed in a weird way not like I'm the greatest but like self-absorbed in the self-hate so that I imagine was really hard to love and be next to. I mean, there's definitely other factors, but like if I'm owning my own side of it, you can't be fully present in a relationship if you are struggling that hard. Nicole, are you enough to love? What a fun question. (laughs) I am enough to love. 
I think that that is a struggle to believe. I know deep down I am, but I think walking through some of the path that I have and especially coming out of a 13 year long marriage, it's really hard to fully believe at the moment. Why is it so hard for you to believe that? I think because when you give your all in a marriage and you give your all to somebody and you really are really trying to adapt and be enough, like you would go back to that being enough. That was a, a uphill battle that I always faced in a marriage was being enough of a wife, the best wife I could be, the most supportive wife, the whatever. And, you know, probably why I had the issues with the eating disorder. Cause I was trying to this perfection thing, you know, I wanted him to have a good looking wife. I wanted him to have a, you know, someone to be proud of. And when you get stuck in that perfection mentality, it, it will get you on so many different levels. But yeah, I think, I think getting your heart broken <laughs> is pretty hard to be like, Hey, is, is it me? Was I the person that was hard to love? <laughs> Do you think on some level you'll always kind of battle not only the eating disorder, I don't want to say demon, but lack of a better wording, battle that on some level? I hope not, but I think that it will be there. I think that it will absolutely be there. I hope that someday it's one of those where you kind of giggle at it and you say like, haha, like good try trying to play with me. We're going to use this to, to win even more people over, you know, use it and not, not use it to tear yourself down. Cause I think that that is a really hard battle when we have struggled with anything. You almost get the hypocrisy feeling, right? Like, oh, I struggled with this. Like, how can I ever help somebody else? I, and maybe that's just me. Like, maybe that, that's just something that I wrestle with. But I think that sometimes that kind of creeps in, right? When you struggle, you're like, okay, I'm going to use it to do good and help other people. And you do. But then you're like, well, then you should fully be better. Or you should fully be A, B, and C. And you start using that to kind of feel like you're not enough. <laughs> well, I think for me, so many times when I've walked through, you know, maybe a bad situation or a, a hurtful situation that I've been the root cause of, and then I go out and I try to share like, oh, hey, don't make the same mistake I've done. Right. I think on some level, all of us have that kind of like in the back of our mind. We're like, almost like, are we a hypocrite in this moment? Are we, are we judgy in this moment? Well, you know, I used to struggle with that, but I don't anymore. Why are you, you know, I, I think on some level, everyone deals with it. I hope everyone deals with it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Fingers crossed. If not, you and I are in the same boat. <laughs> We're on the same island of misfit toys, which I say quite often. I live on the island of misfit toys. In that, I think there's such a healing power when I encounter somebody that I know has walked through a, a very painful situation. Because I know on, on some level, I call it a thorn because I'm a person of faith, there's the proverbial thorn that will stick with you forever that reminds you of that pain so you don't ever go back to that pain ever again. No, absolutely. And you're you're referring to Paul. And I also, yeah, I also believe in the scripture as well. But I think there is such a healing power when I can get to a point where I could share with others and say, listen, I've done that. Don't go down this road. Let me just tell you, I know this sounds wacky and weird, but I ran the Prefontaine run a number of years over in Coos Bay. That is probably the hardest 10K run I've ever I've ever done. And I remember coming back and, and running into some of the Southern Oregon runners that, you know, your sister's the president of, uh -huh. which by the way, she really got mad because I played the presidential march when she came on. Anyway, it was the whole thing. And Ew, I love it. Yes, queen. She was not a fan of that. But anyway, people have to go back and listen to that episode if they really want to hear that. In that, I came back and talked to other runners and they're like, oh, wasn't that bad? Like, kind of like, what's your problem? Like, it wasn't that bad of a run. I'm like, no, it was like the worst. And so I think there's a danger in that too sometimes, right? Is there's the danger that you share something with somebody and, and they almost dismiss the, the journey you've been through. They dismiss the hill that you've climbed to get over to where you are. And that I feel like we need to fix. I say we as a, as a society, as a community, maybe speak to that. Why is there a danger in that? If somebody, again, you're bearing your soul here. If somebody says, oh, she has an eating disorder. Well, sure she did. There's almost like this dismissive, almost judgment. What What's the danger if somebody were to do that actively in your mind? I don't think that it really has an effect because... A lot of times that I have shared about anything that has been hard with me, like, or for me, I should say, like my divorce or eating disorder or, you know, just struggles as a mom. Sometimes that just plays to people's insecurities. 
that they're not ready to address. It's really easy for people to dismiss things that make them uncomfortable. And so I see it a lot of it just being somebody's insecurities and somebody uh, just being uncomfortable. And it's about them and it's not about me. You know, that doesn't take away what I went through or what I'm going through. It just is like, wow, like I hope, my hope honestly when it happens is like, I'm hope, I hope that you come and, and face that, that problem instead of hide from it. Because I was there. I mean, like you said, like I was in denial for a long time. I think a lot of us, super, super easy for us to just sit in denial on the problem that we're struggling with because it's hard and it's uncomfortable. Why do you feel like it's easier to hide in secret than it is to bring stuff out in light? Well, I think a lot of it, and you know, our society has changed quite a bit. I think a lot of it has been the way that we were raised, you know, and I'm not like dissing anybody's parents or my parents or anything like that. But I think as a society, we didn't take mental health seriously. I feel like we just started opening up and saying, hey, I go to therapy. Like that's a normal thing. Before, I think 10, 15 years ago, it was like this secret thing. So we were very open about our struggles. You know, as a society, it was like hide and just deal with your own stuff secretly. Now I think that we are more open and accepting to people not being perfect. So I just quickly Googled, it says eating disorders affect at least 9% of the world's population. 9%. That doesn't seem terribly high, but I wonder about that because I wonder about the, the 9%. How many of them have stepped in your mind, maybe out of the shadow, or how many people are still in that shadow that they just don't want to come out of? Because again, they're in denial. They think, oh, no big deal. Like, what would you say to somebody maybe right now if... I don't know if you're a sports fan at all. I am. I love basketball. You love basketball. Who's your favorite team? Oh, the Blazers, of course. You're you're a Blazer fan. Okay. Yes, Damian Lillard. Oh, he's just the dreamiest. Oh, Damian Lillard. Oh, okay. But if we could put you center court of the Rose Quarter, and we got people from, you know, ladies from all walks of life, maybe even guys, right? Because on, on some level, I think guys maybe struggle with eating disorders, especially. I, I think it's maybe one of those things we don't want to talk about as a guy that we have an eating disorder. You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm just imagining that because I would think, you know, what affects one affects the other in some respects. But if we were to put you center court, rose quarter, and they're, they're dealing with on some level an eating disorder, or maybe, maybe they have a loved one that was lost to the eating disorder, like they ended up taking their life because of their choices, because of their, you know, unhealthy choices. And and we made you the keynote speaker. How cool would that be, right? And we made you the keynote speaker and you had time to prepare. What would you say to that crowd in that moment? <laughs> you had time to prepare, but in this moment, you have no time to prepare. You know, you're the first one that's ever pushed back on that question. Like you have no time to prepare because I'm not giving you any. Roughly, what do you think <laughs> you would say in that moment? You know, honestly, I would say that that 9% is, is, is a lie. Um, there is a lot more, a lot more people out there. And I think a lot more people that are hiding it under a bad diet are having, you know, hiding it under some pretense and they're not really facing it, but deep down they know that this is unhealthy, but to the 9% that are legitimately struggling or, you know what they say, 9%, but I think there's definitely way, way, way more. I would say that your life is more, more than a body. You are so much more than what you physically look like, how much food that you eat, how much food that you don't eat. You're not defined by anything besides the way that you love. And the world needs you as you are in your struggle, in your hardship, coming out of your struggle, in your heartbreak, in your love, holding your baby, be an example to other people. We need you right here, right now to show up as you are sick or healthy, happy or sad. We just need you. And that's what I would tell them. And that's what I would tell myself in that night. I would tell myself, we need you. They need you. So here's the question I always follow that up with is by the way, 19,980 mask max capacity at the Rose quarter. So there you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just shy of 20,000. It's fine. No big thing. It's no big deal. No big deal. It's fine. You did great, by the way. Standing O. Here's my question. In that moment, do you feel like anyone in that audience would, would listen and then apply what you said to their life? I think that they would. I think that, I think that you, I think people would because they need somebody to tell them like, it's okay. You know, it's okay to struggle. 
Like, it's okay to be sick. It's not okay to stay there, but where you are is okay. And I think that there's a lot of hardship for people to say, like, I'm a newbie. Like, you know, this is why people shy away from going to gyms or starting, you know, a new hobby is because they don't want to be the newbie. I think that the principle plays out the same here. Like you just don't want to be the one that is at the back of the line being like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get better. But I think that if, you know, somebody had told me like, dude, it's okay. You're going through a lot. Like you're raising two kids essentially by yourself. You have no family support. You're young. Like, you know, if somebody was like, you have a lot of stuff going on that it's understandable why you're struggling, but Hey, let's do it better. I like that. Let's do it better. Did you grocery shop in those days when you're, when you were dealing with your eating disorder and, and things like that? I would imagine you did, but maybe I'm wrong in that. Yeah, no, I, I, I still had to feed kids. <laughs> okay. They still had to eat. Maybe they weren't me eating macaroni and cheese or, or top ramen. Hopefully not. Cause that's terrible food. I eat it. So it's maybe not that terrible. But I'm just imagining just for a minute at a grocery store, let's, let's just make it Winco because I don't know, Winco jumped into my head. But imagine like you in your, your eating disorder state, pushing your shopping cart, you got the kids in the basket and somehow future you, you in the present right now was somehow transported back in time. You bump into yourself in the, I don't know, the produce aisle or maybe there was the, you know, I don't know, fruit snack aisle. I, again, I don't know. But somehow, you know, future you, time travels back in time space-time continuum is all going to get messed up because you're not supposed to talk to past self, future self, like whole thing just got whack, data whack. But in that moment, if you could have spoken wisdom into past you, what would you have said in that moment? My knee jerk is like to say something silly. I'm like, like buy, buy Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can say something silly. It's fine. It's your, it's the space-time continuum. You can say whatever you want. Buy Bitcoin, girl. <laughs> Honestly, I would you just put me on the spot. Like, I, you know, it's funny because you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to make her cry. And I'm like, I'm not going to cry. This whole thing. If I had to reflect back and I had to see myself and be in that moment and see my girls little. Yeah. You're in that moment. You're at the grocery store. You're seeing past you in all your, I don't want to say glory. Cause that almost no, insinuates like yeah. somehow you're elevated, but in your rawness, maybe that's a better yeah. word in all your rawness, your realness, who you were. Cause I mean, obviously you're, you're in much better shape than you are now mentally, physically, all that. Yeah. And to go back and see that firsthand, what would you speak to that young Nicole? I would probably be stunned. First of all, like I stumble back when I see pictures, I can't even look at pictures of that time frame, honestly, because it's hollow and it's sad and it, it's a waste of time. It was a waste of my time. So I think that what I would do is I would tell her to enjoy that moment, to not focus on essentially being the only person there. I'd be like, what can you do to explore Tennessee? How can you live in the culture? How can you make, you know, a Wednesday fun, you know, like a game night, pizza night, you know, how can you start making things fun and not be so engulfed in the struggle? Because a lot of it, I was just hyper-focused on the problem. It's like when you get a splinter, like, in your finger. That's all you think about is that darn thumb or whatever, you know, has a splinter in it. And I would start veering away from thinking about the problem so much. And I would tell her that. Like, hey, start doing other things. You know, start making memories with your little kiddos. That's what I would tell her. Would she hear you? Would she listen? Would she think you're crazy? I would probably think I was crazy. Let's be real. When you're engulfed in your own struggle... You're like, oh, whatever. Like, you know, the prize is that I'm thin. Like, you know, like, like that really matters. Push comes to shove, you know, because now flash forward, you know, 12 years or 10 years or however long it's been. I'm like, man, I, I wish my kiddos were little and we had Disney nights or we had, you know, whatever. And it's not to say that we didn't have great memories and moments. I know a lot of time was wasted given to this eating disorder. There's this quote that comes to mind and it says this is of all you can see is your pain. You will never see me. Yes. If all you can see is your pain, you will never see me. When you hear that, what comes to mind and, and what's your response to that? I fully agree with what you're saying. This is kind of a silly story, but I recently learned how to ride a motorcycle and they literally tell you like, do not look at me. Like look at the corner that you have to go around because you'll hit me and you'll miss the corner. You have to start looking ahead to where you're going. And that is absolutely 
what I think of when you say that quote is you got to, you know, stop fixating on the problem and start looking at what it could, what it could be like when you're healed or you're better or you're helping other people like look to that future. And honestly, like that is what helped me get better. I started writing and journaling a lot as if I was healed and healthy and reading it to somebody else. So Nicole, if somebody's hearing you right now and they're like, wow, She's not only motivating me, she's encouraging me, she's giving me some solid information and some some really food for thought. And I'm not trying to be funny there. No pun intended. <laughs> but no pun intended there. I really am not trying to be funny. Maybe a little bit because we, we needed to be a little more lighthearted for a Absolutely. moment. Somebody's hearing you right now and, and really in all, in all sense of the word, like it really is resonating with them. You're speaking to their heart right now. Maybe they know somebody, maybe they have walked it themselves. They've never really told anybody and they maybe need to walk that stuff out. What, what encouragement, what, what things would you say in this moment to them to maybe encourage them to, to step out of where they are? I would tell them to start now, like start today, focus on one step at a time. Like you absolutely do not have to do it all at once. You just have to keep marching on. And honestly, that is what my mantra has been post-divorce, you know, starting a whole new life after so long of being married, you know, and having that, that's what you have to do. You have to keep marching on. And you put it one foot in front of the other. And some days you go faster and some days you go slower and some days your backpack's heavier and some days your backpack is lighter, but you keep moving on. And honestly, one of the most ironic quotes that I heard when I was really sick was like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that was what I kept repeating. Every time I had to show up for a meal that I didn't want to have was just one bite at a time, one meal at a time, one choice at a time, you get better and you get healthy. Just make the right choice one time. And then next time, just make the right choice again. And even if you have to make the right choice again, like you'll be better than where you were. That's good stuff. I, I do always, I have always loved that elephant quote, one bite at a time when you have to face a major project or maybe something you're not really excited about doing is just one bite at a time. That's how you eat an elephant. So that's good advice too. But Nicole, again, I, I just want to give you an opportunity right now. If if there's any way you can help somebody, again, how can somebody maybe reach out to you and, and maybe talk to you privately about that if you're willing to to maybe help those that maybe have walked through this or, or maybe just need some motivation and getting off the proverbial couch or maybe even it's the proverbial ground because they felt so beaten down that they need somebody to pick them up off the ground. How can you help in that respect? Oh, my Instagram DMs are always open. And my email address and is on my website. My heart beams when I help somebody else. Like it gives, it like brings justification to that person who was struggling back then. It was like, yes, like God walked me through this really hardship so that I can turn around for this moment and help somebody. So if you are struggling, the first thing, the first thing, and I, you know, I wrote this down and the first thing that honestly got me healed was admitting that I had a problem. And I think that that's with anything, right? You know, with like alcoholism, the first step is admitting that you have an issue. That's with anything. If you are struggling, if you are, you know, deep in your eating disorder, it's the first thing to say like, yeah, I think that's me. And maybe you truly don't know because you're sick in the denial or our society has said, oh, you're on a really great diet. No, you're not. You're unhealthy. You know, <laughs> your mind's too consumed by food. You're not okay. You know, you need a more balanced life. So if anyone ever wants to reach out to me, I'm more than willing to listen and more than willing to understand where they are. So what's that website again, just so we can get that? It's uh, www.newlifewellnessor.com. All right. We will, of course, link all of that in our show notes. So now, Nicole, I know this about you. Your sister's kind of hyper competitive. Did that <laughs> skip over you or are you kind of equally as hyper competitive? We're, I don't feel competitive with my sister just because she is a jewel and a gem. Like she literally is my biggest cheerleader and my biggest Golly, like I, if I was not sisters with her, I would find her and make her be friends with me because she is by far the best person to have in your corner. So I feel no competition towards her at all. Well, no, I just wonder because she's like kind of competitive. Like she wants to be a winner. She <laughs> believes in winning. So I just wondered, is that kind of in your DNA as well? Or did that skip over you? Oh, come on. Yes. No, it absolutely is. Remember I said I'm all in and maybe I shouldn't have went all in. Yeah, no. 
I am, you know, I, I'm going to strive to be the best version of me. Like, I don't want to compete. I don't want to be the best version of, you know, so-and-so or the best overall. I want to be the best me because that is what is going to add value to this life. I love that a lot. So I'm very competitive with myself. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So you're competitive with yourself. Okay, perfect. We even called you, I think, a fitness nut or fitness fanatic, yeah. I think, at the onset. But in that, you do know we have how many senses? Help me with this. It's part of our game called Senseless. Oh, your five senses? Is that what you're talking about? Do, do we have five senses or do we have more than five? I've heard upwards of 10. I've heard as low as three. I've heard six. Can you just put this to rest once and for all for me? Because you, I'm, I'm leaning heavily into you right now with your fitness enthusiasm. You got to know the answer to this question. Like my test anxiety is like, I'm starting to sweat. Like I, you know, I think that we have, I'm going to say seven senses. I'm not going to ask you to name them. That might take a while. So you mentioned that you're a Blazers fan. There is a guy playing for the Blazers right now, Nurseer Little. He played college basketball at the University of North Carolina. I don't know if you knew that. There's a Blazer, so I will I did not concede know that. the Blazers for a moment to say that they are North Carolina fans. I'm a huge North Carolina fan, if you couldn't tell from behind me. A lot of light blue in this house. A lot of light blue. So like the sky, who doesn't love the sky, right? It's a good color. It's a good color. And the ocean's blue. Right? Exactly. right? Anyway, ocean, so we're going to play this yeah. game called Senseless. So I'm going to roll because even though you're sort of in town, like I'm in Eagle Point, you're, point. we could have met up, but that's fine. We, we like doing virtual stuff. So especially with COVID and sickness and flu and yes, exactly. all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. It's cold and flu season. We're, we're just, we're being thankful and, and socially distanced. Still. Yes. Not introverts and loving being in our home. No, we are totally extroverts in our homes, outside of our homes, all that stuff. So anyway, I'm going to roll for you. So here you go. I'm going to roll. I feel like I just got thrown into this game, so I'm ready. You did. It's a game called Senseless. Like I said, it's just a fun way we end the show. It's senseless. It's kind of pointless. That's why we named it Senseless. This is weird. This is how wacky the die is. Now, this is the die in my hand. These are random questions. Now, you do see that number right there, right? What number is that? That's five. Yeah. Number five. This is the question. I did not change this or alter it in any way. Hey. What is your favorite thing to taste? Now, how did it know we've been talking about food this whole time? I promise you, like, how did the die know we've been talking about food? How does the die know? It how does the die knows. know? It just knows. It just, yeah. It's like the eight ball. It just knows. The magic eight ball. That's what I'm referring to, not the drug eight ball. I don't even no. know about that. I don't even know. I didn't I even, even know it was that. a drug. Even like I don't even today. know. I've heard no. that. I've, I've heard that. Too many New Jack City references probably already. <laughs> so favorite thing to taste is what? Peanut butter. I love peanut butter. You didn't even like think about that. Like you just knew. No, I didn't hate you. Now, is it Jif peanut butter? Is it creamy peanut butter? Is it chunky peanut? I mean, there's so many variations of peanut butter. Is there, is there a thing? Apple peanut butter? Is that a thing? Oh, that sounds gross. I'm sure it is a thing. I'm a fan of chunky peanut butter, but like the natural one that you have to stir, which I absolutely hate stirring it. But once it's stirred and it's like super creamy and chunky, done. Love it. Favorite thing ever. What is your favorite thing to put peanut butter on? I absolutely love it with oatmeal. 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 Yes, it is. It's so good. Don't don't think I'm crazy. Or a banana. A banana and peanut butter is really good too. You're over here dying. <laughs> I hate bananas. Bananas and peas and onions. I can't get like around. And I'm just like, let's talk about bananas. <laughs> yeah, no. I I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid, I cannot stand the texture of bananas. Like it literally makes me gag. Like just even thinking about it. Like it just I know, I saved you. And it was a moment. I'm like, quit gagging because I'm gagging. I can't do vomit. <laughs> You, I didn't make you cry, but you made me gag. So I don't know. Victory. I don't know how that works. Victory, victory goes to the guests. Nicole, you're amazing. I just want you to know that. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me in on the show. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. I know we talked about some tough stuff today, and I just want to say thank you again for being real and being so transparent and just allowing your voice to, I believe, really speak into the darkness into someone's life and to say, listen, you don't have to live there. You don't have to be there. In fact, I have this little thing called a mag light. I'm going to help show you the way out of the darkness. And I love that you were willing to do that today. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for providing the space, honestly. And I'm glad that I did. I was seriously about to call out. I was going to ghost you the 2021 thing to do, <laughs> but I'm like, no, I have to do this. Like it's, it's funny. Cause you know, you had offered the show and I literally was thinking about it a week before and a couple of friends had mentioned something about, you know, me being more vocal and then the opportunity presented. So I really appreciate the space to, to be honest and hopefully be the light for somebody out there. 
So guys and gals, kids and campers alike, I don't know about anybody else. I've never, at least in my mind that I know of, in all the journeys and all the, the people I've interacted with, I don't believe I've ever spoken to someone that has struggled or battled through an eating disorder and that has been willing to speak about it. So I'm going to ask you a question as, as, we, as I do so often. I'd like to leave you with a question, a challenge for you this next week. Can you ask that question? It kind of actually tears me up inside just thinking about it. Can you ask somebody, maybe this is where the Thanksgiving meal comes in. I don't know. That awkward Thanksgiving meal. Maybe, maybe we have these. I don't know. I know I did as a kid. We always had that awkward Thanksgiving conversation because we're all around the table. Maybe it's not an appropriate Thanksgiving conversation, but I want to challenge you this next week. Go to someone you know. Go to someone that you really trust and ask them this question. Say, hey, is there a secret? Is there something in your life that you have not shared with me? I know that's really bold. That's like a control B on the keypad. Like that's how you make the bold sign. By the way, I'm not like swearing, but like when you do control B it makes everything bold. That's a very bold statement to do. I know. But well, listen, I believe there's power in that. Go to the one that you love. Go to the one that you trust and ask them, hey, is there a secret you haven't told me that maybe you've been carrying around for way too long? That maybe you're tired of carrying that around? If you do that, let me know. I would love to know the result of that. I would love to know that you really spoke into somebody's life, spoken into somebody's heart and ask them that question because I believe that's when true, not only intimacy takes place, but I believe that's where true friendship really can, can really blossom into something amazing. Oh, by the way, if on some level you are struggling with an eating disorder, I do believe, and I firmly believe this, Nicole has made herself available to you. Maybe you don't feel comfortable going to me. I'm okay with that. I really am. But will you do me a favor? If you're struggling with this on any level, will you please reach out to her and let her be that source of encouragement for you, that way to get you out of that darkness and into a new life? She has a heart for that. She has a love for that. And gosh darn it, you're worthy enough of that. And you're enough for her to reach out to. You are. Believe that. All right, I'm done. Soapbox over. Just remember this. Do not ever forget. Do not ever forget this. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.